I'm Lorenzo Ferrari, editorial coordinator at the European Data Journalism Network. In the last episode uh, of this podcast, we talked about the value and potential of doing data journalism about uh, European issues. Doing data journalism about multiple countries uh, or the entire Europe is different from doing data journalism about a single country, however. So in this episode, we'd like to uh, look at the specific specificities of doing data journalism on European stories. Why is it different from data journalism on national stories? What specific challenges are there? And what should one pay special attention to? Uh, we'll talk about this with our uh, two guests today, who are Alexander Damiano Ricci and uh, Clara Gibor. Alexander uh, collaborates with our uh, member Box Europe and has been one of the most prolific contributors to EDGNet so far. He is involved in a bunch of other projects for journalistic coverage of EU affairs. While uh, Clara is a data journalist at Journalism Plus Plus in uh, Stockholm, uh, she carried out uh, four investigations for uh, EDGNet so far, and she'll tell us more about them in a bit. So um, let's start from where data journalists usually start, so uh, the sources of data. Uh, and the problem here is that um, data covering more than one country sometimes exists, but in many cases it must be created from, from scratch or assembling different national sources. And this is typically quite time and resource consuming to, to do so. And even when data on multiple countries exist, this uh, may depend on the collection, on the choice of an institution or on the work on an, on an organization that assembled those data. And this doesn't necessarily take journalistic relevance into account or doesn't necessarily fit journalists' uh, questions. So maybe you have a nice idea for a story, but you don't have data to tell it. So um, in the cases where you decide to use data that is already available, how can you make uh, the most of it? How can you provide the story with a good framing, matching the journalistic idea you have with available data? Um, Alexander, do you, do you have, how, do you, how do you proceed when you... Yeah. Hi, Lorenzo. Uh, thank you for the invitation, first of all. It's very nice to be here with you, um, talking about uh, these issues uh, with Clara as well. Um, yeah, it's definitely a challenge in my experience, um, to be honest, in, um, in producing data journalist stories. Um, but it's more generally, I think, a challenge for not only journalists, it's a challenge even for researchers. Um, my past experience before doing uh, pro producing data, data journalism stories was in a university, for instance, in, in Milan, where I worked for a research project. And this issue of comparability and having, uh, you know, meaningful data across countries is a challenge all the time, actually. Um, so it's not something only journalists face. I think it's something even researchers face. Um, I believe that the, the, the more universal you want to make claims, the more, more difficult it gets, usually. So um, uh, I think that, that even contextualization here is, I mean, I guess it's a key word which has come up even in, in other podcast episodes of uh, of this series, um, but I believe that you know the closer you you get to the topic you want to investigate, the easier it is even to then uh, fine tune you know the categories you want to analyze, the, um, you want to fit data in. Um, so I think this is a, a first key concept I believe in in, in my in my opinion. Um, then of course there is. Um, there's something which might sound really trivial, but in my experience, it has always helped me is that you need to work with people who know the, the subject, the matter you are analyzing. So mm, no one is an expert of everything. It's really rare to find someone who is an expert of one single thing already. <laughs> so uh, whenever you do a data journalism story, I think it's, it's really important to, to spot the right person with whom you can collaborate and work probably in different countries. So there's no, as my, my experience, there's no such a thing like a, you know, a European journalist, it's always a nice way to, to frame, uh, you know, a curriculum. 
but then necessarily everyone is you know based in one country is born in one country one can talk maybe one more one of one language but data journalism at the european level is always a matter of collaboration and i think it's key even to be able to make comparison between countries um so i think these are the first things i would like to to put into the conversation and um, i think we can talk about many more things but this is the first things i wanted to say yeah and clara how do you um, how do you see this <laughs> Yeah, no, I completely agree. Um, it is definitely a challenge. And I think that something which you kind of touched on here, which is, I think is really important, is the issue that arises with like contextualizing the data that you have, which is such a crucial part of data journalism, right? Like numbers on their own don't really mean anything, you know, without under understanding the wider context. And that becomes even more important, right, when you're looking at figures that come from several different countries. Um and you might not be, you, you know, you're going to be less familiar with them. You're going to be working in languages that you don't, uh, trying to gather data um, uh, when you're not familiar with the languages. Um, and this means, you know, you have to, you have to, you have to do your research. You have to, you know, you can't just be satisfied with what, what the numbers say, right? Um, and you just, you need to be very careful, I think, just drawing conclusions from, uh, from just the figures, right? Um Yeah, uh, and I don't know, from um, looking at the experience we had at the EDDNet in the, this past few few years, now it's four years that we are running almost. Um, I mean, uh, we, we could see all of this, I think, on a daily or even weekly uh, basis. Um, what uh, we could also see is that um, actually, if you want to do... Um, If you want to cover European issues with data journalism, at the end, you, you do have the possibility of telling a lot of stories, or, uh, of covering a lot of topics, uh, a lot of themes. And this is not uh, trivial. I mean, when one thinks about the European Union, maybe one has uh, mainly, I don't know, the financial issues in mind or some kind of Uh, regional development, infrastructure, uh, and things like that. Uh, but at the end, uh, I mean, we, we covered a lot of issues which don't necessarily have a lot of to do with the, um, with the, I don't know, the, the data that is collected from Eurostat, for instance. I mean, you can do a lot uh, more using other sources, um, which is, um, I mean, important from a journalistic perspective so that... Uh, you have your own agenda, you have your own stories that you want to tell and you find ways to tell it. But again, it's not, it's not always easy to, uh, to find a way. I mean, I think any, any of us had the experience that we had a, an idea or we wanted to cover a topic and tell a story about this. And then, okay, th there is not enough data or there is no data at all. Or there is, uh, I mean, this is, I guess, something quite common. And on the other hand, sometimes I think it happens that you're looking at some data for which are not maybe exciting or for any kind of reason, and you find in them something curious uh, and which allows you to tell a story that you didn't expect, but it, which is interesting. And and this, it, I think it happens, especially if you look like a Eurobarometer or this sort of sources, uh, which maybe cover a lot of topic and there's a lot which is kind of boring <laughs> to be honest but then maybe there is like one one thing that uh, and then the lights <laughs> goes on or uh, something like that i don't know if you have this experience yeah Clara. so i to i totally agree with that um i um so i think yours that is a great resource actually um for, as you were saying that like gathering the data is like this kind of big first hurdle when you're working with kind of these pan-European stories, um, you know, because finding data at like a granular regional level um, for several countries isn't, isn't exactly easy. Um, and Eurostat, I think, has like quite a lot of hidden gems um, that, uh, so for instance, uh, some of the stories that we've done on uh, looking at um, the risk of poverty across all European regions, for instance. Um, this comes from, this kind of originates with um, a Eurostat uh, data set, basically. 
Um, we also did um, we also did an analysis of uh, excess deaths for EDJNet last year, which actually started out with um, with data that was collated through. There was Eurostat was actually collating data uh, regional data for some countries, um, but not all. And we kind of had to um, we had to combine that with the kind of manual data gathering that you that you were talking about to get a more complete picture. So that's often the case as well that you kind of have to combine several different sources. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I think uh, what you did with the access that um, work was really like a, a good example of this, that uh, combining sources, but then, uh, of course, when you try to combine sources uh, on your own, you sometimes struggle with, um, like in this case, countries counting uh, COVID-related uh, deaths in different ways uh, or with different time lags, uh, and I mean, you, you, it's not always easy, <laughs> even if you find no. national data to combine them, right? Definitely. Actually, I think um, in a way, there is a benefit to when you do it, when you're doing quite a lot of manual data gathering, because you're more aware of that, of those risks that you mentioned. Uh, you're kind of, you're kind of looking out for these differences in maybe differences in how a topic is defined or differences in how the data is gathered as you were, as you were kind of talking about. Um, whereas if it's a data set that is already presented to you and looks, you know, it kind of, it looks co quite complete. You've got like data collected from different countries. It kind of lulls you into a, a sense of false security that you might think, well, this is very straightforward and it's, you know, um, it might not be, immediately apparent to you that it's not easily comparable. Um, and actually, you know, if you kind of, you know, once you start doing your research, um, that topic, you know, that thing that you thought was the same topic across countries might, upon closer inspection, turn out to have, um, to be defined differently across countries, or, you know, you might have differences in reporting rates, uh, things like that. So you have to be, have to be aware and a little bit kind of uh, on guard for that, I would say. Alexander, do you want to, to add something? Yeah, yeah, there are, there are a lot of things actually we could, I think, talk about is um, it even uh, it even depends what kind of data one wants, wants to analyze. I mean, uh, for instance, it's, it's probably easier to have, you know, comparability across countries if you have survey data, where there's a uniform kind of um, way of asking things to people, for instance. You know, that's why I think survey data can be really powerful, actually. Um, and, uh, and in my past experience, it has always been easier in this kind of, you know, instances to, to do comparisons between countries. Um, I think it's fascinating when someone creates, you know, on, on his own, uh, some variables, like if I'm not mistaken, I mean, besides the excess that, um, which is kind of probably a middle way, if I may say so. Um, but for instance, when you have produced this investigation about um, the distance from train stations in, uh, in different countries, and that that's really interesting to me. Um, not to not to undervalue Eurostat or anything like that. But I think the more you create categories which make sense to people, even you know, in their ordinary lives. Um, the more it gets interesting when when you when you push the publish the story, you know, because that's a story which actually tells um, to everyone something, and it does so by uh, an effort which is actually creating your own. You know, I don't think there, if I'm not mistaken, I don't believe that there exists a database or a data set, you know, European in scope which tells you the distance from uh, from one place to another. But it's just a smart idea, you know, it's a smart idea, and uh, in time is universal. I mean in the context of uh, non-relativity of Einstein, but um, uh, <laughs> if I may say, um, not, I, I don't want to contradict Einstein, of course, but um, I think that's, uh, uh, that's, that's, that's something which was really interesting. I think that's really interesting even for, you know, data journalism can be, can be easily boring for people, I, I believe, you know, if you just put data out there, if you just put graphs out there, you nevertheless have to find a hook with you know with what people is interested in, um, and I just wanted to to pick this this example for instance, but then I I would like even to share this this insight about more 
Um, even inside the European Union and in Eurostat, I think there are specific data sets which are more useful to do comparative analysis, you know, and it's, for instance, the economic uh, data sets, you know, uh, GDP or stuff like that, which is, uh, let's say, more, it somehow mirrors even the way the European Union is organized and what kind of pillars inside the European Union, for instance, are more developed in terms of policy making, you know. Um, being an economic union where there's a lot of coordinating coordination around economic uh, indicators, those indicators are usually the, the most consistent across countries, you know. But as soon as, for instance, you go into the social domain, I would say, you know, welfare and all those kind of policies, there it immediately gets more tricky, you know, because every welfare system, as we know, in the European Union is managed by its own uh, national state. And, you know, and, and this is mirrored somehow in the data. And Coming from that world, you know, of 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 of, of academic research and welfare studies, um, uh, I I I remember that this is always, you know, a point even in in you know, in, in academic research. You know, how can we make sure that we have the same, you know, kind of variables and we measure things in the same way? Um, so there is definitely a connection between the structure in which we are living uh, and the data we produce as institutions. I believe, um, yeah. Yeah, and uh, uh, in some cases, uh, I think it's useful and possible to to move past what the institutions uh, do or collect for their own uh, good or for their own goals. Uh, and um, I mean, in some cases, uh, you can use like open street map data or other crowdsource data. And, I mean, data that really uh, to some extent, connect with the people's individual experience or interests uh, and um, are not necessarily related to policies by either European or national institutions. And in some cases, I think these sort of data are very handy when it comes to doing or trying to do multinational stories. And at the same time, you always have to be aware of possible national differences, maybe in some countries, I don't know, open street, uh, open street lab data are more granular or more in other countries, or maybe in the countryside, they are less uh, complete or anything like that, which also is, um, is an issue. And uh, in some cases, uh, when you rely on, um, on some extent on self-reporting by, by people, you also see national differences may, which are not necessarily reflecting actual phenomena but are connected to cultural differences maybe or uh, or to political i don't know i, I have in mind uh, for instance the data about violence against women of course you know, we know that uh, the countries where this is reported uh, the most cases of violence are not necessarily the countries where uh, the violence is most widespread so um, uh, or, or something similar you, you can see on we looked recently at um, depression and mental health, and again, some of the countries where apparently there's very little people who declare to be depressed or suffer from mental health problems are not necessarily the countries where this is non-existent, but maybe the countries where the, the stigma is higher. So again, it's, it's sometimes tricky and sometimes I think there's a story uh, in the data itself and uh, like a sort of meta story of why some data are <laughs> built in a sort of way or what are the limits of, of this data. May I add something Lorenzo? Uh, just out sure. of the, a bit out of the box it's um, it, it, it occurred to me to do some uh, big data analysis on Twitter for a number of years uh, and I think that social media data are really powerful in the sense because these metrics they have, they are so standardized uh, oftentimes, you know, that, you know, a like is a like. Obviously, then we could say that, you know, in different national contexts, a like is different than from a like in, in let's say, in Spain and Hungary. But I mean, this would be really sophisticated. I mean, as a reflection, I, I feel, um, which makes uh, analyzing social media data really interesting, I think. Um, obviously, I don't enter in the ethics, you know, of, of then, uh, you know, assuming that what means a like, uh, what means a retweet, etc. But this fact that these data are so uh, standardized somehow, that, that makes it really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and maybe the, this links to some extent to um, 
another possible uh, or another aspect, another challenge that uh, doing that journalism about multiple countries um, is facing, which is how, how to deal with uh, different languages or with multiple languages, which is definitely a, a big issue when you do some sort of textual analysis, for instance, using social media uh, uh, data. Uh, and at EDGNet, uh, we are very keen on this topic because uh, we, we publish stories in up to 11 languages. We always publish in original language plus uh, in English and in some cases in, uh, in other uh, different languages. I mean, this is something uh, we think it's really one of the, the key features of doing data journalism at the European level or having a European perspective on, on data journalism. And again, I think, um, as we all know, that there's plenty of languages in Europe uh, and, and this doesn't necessarily make um, things easier for journalists. You can make analysis trickier. And uh, on one hand, there might be... Um, there might be the need to know uh, at least a little bit uh, the language uh, of the country you're, you're dealing with uh, in order to really understand the data or find the data. Uh, and in some cases, the, I wonder if there's, um, of course, it's much easier to rely on English uh, speaking sources and reports and data sets and, and databases and so on. But I wonder whether there's uh, the risk of losing something in there, if there's maybe some, some something which uh, stays out of the picture. Mm, I think bo both of you have, have experience with, with doing data journalism and journalism in general, with uh, covering different countries, using different sources, and how, how, what's your view on the limits and potential of uh, having multiple languages. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that I see what you're saying about using uh, kind of English uh, language sources or data sets. Uh, but I, I think the problem with that is that you're kind of, it, it's, it kind of becomes like a secondhand source a lot of the time. Um, so if you're kind of, if you're doing this sort of manual data gathering across countries, um, I think it is better to go to like as direct sources as possible. Um, but then again, like there's another kind of difficulty again of, of data gathering when, you know, maybe the data is available, but in a language that you're not familiar with. And, you know, how can you be sure that you're correctly understanding the figures when you're like translating the methodology through Google Translate? Um, <laughs> it's, definitely an extra, it's definitely an extra hurdle. Um, although having said that, um, you know, technology has made things possible that would not <laughs> would not have been possible <laughs> um, working, you know, a decade ago or something like that. Um, so, I I agree, and um, and another aspect of, of of how I think multilingualism enters the picture is even then in the visualization part of of data. Um, the sense that um, obviously, I mean, not, not everyone has, um, I mean, if we have a newsroom where you have a lot of people, you know, working on data stories, it's, it's most likely that you have even, you know, a, a data visualiz visualization expert who can probably, you know, provide interfaces in multiple languages. I don't know, but out there most of the times, I think that Lorenzo, you know it as well. I mean, there are a couple of free tools. I mean, as soon as you get to know them, then they get not so free anymore, but anyhow, um, that you need to copy um, every single graph in different languages and, and even translate the information you're showing in that in, in that in that graphs. You know, it's uh, it's one thing. Obviously, it's uh, it's something which adds to the picture or more on the on the publishing side. Um, but I think that even here, relatively to what Clara said, um, I think this brings me personally back to the to the importance of collaborating with people. You know, in other countries uh, when you do um, transnational data Absolutely. journalism. I totally agree. Yeah. So um, there are small nuances sometimes that you, you just you, you cannot understand. You know, you cannot understand if you're not native, and um, it you can lose a lot of time. You know, after 
digging into a data set. I mean, how many times have we looked into a data set, you know, for hours and then, you know, you, uh, you know, you understand it was actually uh, pointless because you had overlooked something which was linked to a linguistic detail, you know, you couldn't understand. I mean, it, to me, it happened a lot of times. Um, so I always prefer when there's someone who's native in, in a given language who can understand the notes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think that that's, that's what, you know, what, uh, each of us <laughs> experienced uh, to, to some to some extent, and um, I was thinking at the at the data visualizations that you mentioned, Alexander, and the, their multilingual uh, mm. or the possibility or the need to have them in different languages and the tools that allow uh, it. And in some cases, they they are very helpful, at least in translating all the names of the European countries, which is always. Uh, they are so similar from one language to the other, but you have to pay attention to any single letter, which is maybe the only one which <laughs> differs from one language to the other. Um, no, but, but um, I think when we um, established EDGNet, um, w one of the idea that was there was, okay, we want to um, promote uh, more like uh, collaborative journalism in Europe or in journalism about European affairs. And data journalism can be useful because, to some extent, data visualization work uh, even if you don't really know the language. So if you see a map and your country or any other country stands out, then, okay, of course, if you have a, the, the whole article telling the whole story, it's very useful. But that single database can already convey some, some sort of story or some sort of information, at least, that may, may make you curious about it and uh, may, may circulate uh, quite um, easily across language barriers to some extent. Of course, this depends a lot on the kind of visualization. And uh, I mean, of course, uh, maps probably work particularly well here uh, because really you can connect qu quite easily. Um, and yeah. To, to some extent, I think that this is one, one of the um, of the advantages of, of data journalism uh, content compared to more traditional uh, ways of, of covering uh, stories. The, these visual elements, I think, it helps in in, mm -hmm. in crossing language barriers to some extent, of course. And um, I was wondering if you. Um, I mean, bo both at uh, Vox Europe and uh, Journalist Plus Plus, you've got uh, quite a, an international audience. So um, you have uh, Journalist Plus Plus, you have a Swedish audience, but also you have like a, a larger audience and you have your partners in, in, in Portugal and, and so on. So um, is there anything you, you, feel, uh, you feel like sharing or you, you think it's important to share in, in a way or in the choices you make when you publish a story, in what sort of language you choose to, to publish it in, and sort of language you use it you use to circulate that story. So, like newsletters and social media and uh, different channels, you do different linguistic choices. Um, let's say um, there's always this problem reaching out to the European public or to an international audience. Do you take for granted that they speak English, or is it? better to mm. prove other strategies how do you yeah. do no definitely i think that's a really good uh, a really good point so um so a, a lot of what we do at, at uh, journalism plus plus and and the kind of daughter company newsworthy is aimed at uh swedish local newsrooms but uh, within the within the collaborations that we've done with with edjnet um we do, I mean, English is our working language. Like we do publish, um, you know, we share our data sets in English and we do publish the kind of main articles in English, but we do try to make it um, as easy as possible for that to be reproduced in other languages. Uh, so uh, for, the, uh, for the article to be, you know, translated uh, and be republished uh, by partners, you know, to be republished in Spanish or be republished in French. Um, and uh, here again, it's, 
we, 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 you know, we can share the SVG versions of graphics so that it's easy to kind of repurpose them for different languages. Um, and I think that that is, uh, like, certainly English is our working language, but I do think that it's important to, to make it as easy as possible to kind of, um, to, to repurpose and, and adapt for different, for other languages. I think that's, um, um, it's interesting what you, the, the point you highlighted, Lorenzo, because I have the feeling that sometimes, you know, there's the same data, the same visualizations uh, could be dealt with and then in a, in a really different way, according to which audience you are targeting, actually. I mean, we all have this kind of tendency, I would say, you know, to just, you know, translate a story into another language in, when we work on multiple, you know, European language projects, for instance, you know, but obviously you have to be consistent. So you publish the same story in different languages, but I would say that it's, it's, it's not, uh, it's not a scandal if I say that I wouldn't write the same story. I mean, I wouldn't write a story in the same exact way, you know, for an audience which lives in Spain compared to an audience which lives in, in Oh yeah, absolutely. In yeah. So, and doesn't mean um, that... I'm more saying that, like, it's a good starting point. Hmm. And it, it, um, the, um, the data can be interesting for different audiences for different reasons that, that, that I, I believe, at least. Um, and yeah, I think I know I saw it here. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is absolutely, I think, well, this is a crucial aspect uh, that, that you mentioned, Alexander. The, this tension between providing audiences across Europe with the same story, because and that's the story you can come up with and you want to be consistent but at the same time you need not to take anything from granted because uh, people may be very familiar with some issue in one country but not in the other and uh, to, to be aware of how different audiences may may see something different in your story and mm -hmm. how they may react different and maybe if you had the chance to target different audiences in a more tailored way that would be more effective in some cases. And this tension is always very, I think, um, very present in many works on data journalism and uh, European issues. Yeah. Can I add something to uh, that, absolutely. Lorenzo? Um, so I would say that this is not only a cross-border issue, actually. Um, I would say, so... Um, I mentioned uh, that a lot of the work that I do at, at Journalism Plus Plus is with our daughter company, Newsworthy. And what we do is kind of automate local data journalism, especially for, for, for Swedish newsrooms. Um, and so a lot of what we do there is kind of aimed at local newsrooms rather than directly for the kind of wider audience. And I think that this is kind of, uh, is kind of part of the reason is that we hope that, uh, I mean, the kind of, ideal would be that local reporters would kind of take the, the stats and the stories that we stand up, send out as like a starting point and a kind of build on those because um, they are able to add the kind of proper local context that I think that you're talking about, which, you know, isn't possible for us to add at scale for each individual region, because we are kind of, you know, even within Sweden, if we are sending out news reports for each municipality on a topic, that's 290 um, different different angles, um, sorry, different reports. Um, so we, we can't hope to get, even within one country, we can't hope to get that local context. So the ideal, I think, is to be able to combine, like, the data journalism skills that we can provide with the kind of local context that, that local reporters and local newsrooms are able to add on to that. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah, and, uh, and I think that this brings us uh, back to one of the points that Alexander made uh, at the beginning on the on how important is the contextualization or the need to have local expertise and uh, 
on one hand, I think um, digital journalism, uh, uh, especially at the European scale, can be very, very powerful in a way uh, when you compare different cities, regions, you know, whatever uh, else. Uh, because, I mean, for instance, you can say, uh, it allows you to say, hey, uh, reader, have you seen this? See, this city is the, I don't know, the, the most polluted in Europe, not just in your country, but in the entire Europe. I, I think this makes uh, the, the, the story more powerful, uh, more, even more newsworthy. So Absolutely. this is very powerful, but on the other hand, uh, you have to be careful when, when you compare, right? Mm. And, and yeah, the, the, the risk, uh, you always have this risk of comparing uh, pears and apples. And we, we, we all know uh, European countries are, are very different in, in terms of size, uh, in terms of uh, demographic structure. Some of them are very concentrated in large cities and very sparse countryside. Some of them are different. And some of them have huge populations. Some of them are very small. Some of them are rich. Some of them are poor. I mean, uh, all this, uh, according to the story you're telling, these differences may... may uh, make a difference or I mean, you, you should pay attention to them if you want to compare uh, the, the countries or the regions in a, in a proper way or in a meaningful way. Uh, I, I don't know, how, you know what, what's your experience with this. Uh, I think this applies uh, as Clara you were saying rightly, even within the same country. It's not the same to compare Stockholm with the, the I don't know, the northernmost region of Sweden, uh, whose name, uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. Uh, you're absolutely right. And I keep, I, I kind of keep coming back to what we were talking about earlier on, that the importance of kind of, um, of kind of doing your research early on and making sure that you're talking to experts in the, in the area um, or on the topic. It just like, it cannot be overstated. Hmm. Um, Alexander? Yeah, there's, yeah, there's even, um, I think when we, if we talk specifically about European comparisons between countries, for instance, um, there, are, there are some patterns that notwithstanding the issue come, come back in my experience, which is kind of a really broader regional clustering of how countries perform. Um, so it, it's many times, I think that's the most interesting to show. Uh, thanks for European audience, you know, um, that it, it's likely that countries from Eastern Europe perform in a specific way on specific variables compared to Southern ones. Um, and I think this is something which is really specific to Europe somehow. Um, I, I find this all the time, to be honest, you know, uh, and no, no matter what kind of, 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 of data, it, it's really often that, you know, you find that, yeah, that, you know, former URS uh, countries perform differently just you know from others and that southern european countries perform another way and sometimes i think that this way of clustering can be can be an interesting with all the limitations you need to you know to to inform the audience with uh and all the caveats um i think that one topic we haven't we haven't had the chance to talk about today is the issue of how often and how important the way it's to really carefully you know the big correlations or said that there is a correlation between things. I mean, oftentimes we're just exploring data. We're just portraying data. We're just sketching data. Um, and there's a tendency of wanting always to define, you know, causal relationships, but even in a case of correlation, you know, where it's not the case actually, um, to, to give more meaning to data than, than what the data actually say. I think that that's an issue which data journalism has, and it's not the fault of data journalism, journalism per se, but I, I don't know if Clara agrees with this. I have the feeling that there has been kind of a hype at a certain point when it comes to data journalism, that that there was something, you know, that, that everyone had to do no matter what. <laughs> and um, so... No, I absolutely agree. <laughs> so, I mean, I think that 15 years ago, no <laughs> one was... I think that the term data journalism didn't even exist I don't know. Uh, at a certain point, everything was data journalism, um, which I'm mentioning just for the for the sake of yeah of, of how it's. I think it's really important to outline all the limits of the data you are you're showing to people. 
um, and just being humble on that side, you know, humble and saying that you have found this, that you're sketching it in this way because you think that this shows you something. Um, but... Yeah, I think that you touched on a really important point there, which is kind of the, the broader importance of like transparency, I think, mm -hmm. in your, you know, in reporting more broadly, which... Um, as you were saying about potential limitations with the data or, you know, being transparent with uh, your, your methodology and ideally, you know, sharing data sets when possible, things like that. I think all of that is really important to building trust mm. with your readers, with your audience. I think that's a really good point. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, and um, I just wanted to, to go back to well, one of the things you, you both said or hinted at the uh, the importance or, or the um, of the scale of the the comparison let's say on one hand uh, it, it makes sense or it happens that you end up comparing north and south europe or east and west europe uh, rather than countries because that's how they they cluster basically uh, and this can be i think uh, um an effective way to, to frame your narrative and at the same time you have to be uh, aware of the risk that you you adopt this as a lens through which you, you read uh, all the European issues. I mean, in some cases, I think it's very interesting when, um, when for instance, it's a bit counterintuitive, maybe the result of the comparison. So you compare East and West Europe and you find out that Eastern Europe for some reason is uh, better than, than the West in some cases. Like uh, we published a story recently on how fast uh, internet or broadband is in Romania rather than in, in other, many other European countries. I, I mean, in, in this case, I think the East-West comparison is, is very it can be interesting, you see. Hey, I was expecting something, but at the end, data show you that uh, reality is a bit different. It's more complex in a way than, than mm. you would expect. And I think this is interesting. And at the other level, going down to the local level is also very powerful, I think, and comparing regions and cities rather than entire countries, especially if you have very large and diverse countries, like my country, Italy, is... Uh, the, the Italian national average of any kind of data you, you may take it doesn't necessarily mean a lot. Uh, maybe yeah, you have so so many differences within the country that you should rather compare regions or, or, or local uh, communities. I don't know. Yeah, I think I think that's absolutely right. I mean, when it comes down to it, like we've been talking a lot about the sort of hurdles that exist with uh, with. Uh, doing these sort of pan-European stories. But uh, having said that, despite all of those difficulties, we do try very hard to sort of collect these local and regional figures. Um, and you might wonder, like, why is, you know, why bother? <laughs> but I think that what you're saying about these kind of huge internal disparities within countries, um, I think that's a really good point, that those are, those are obscured if we just focus on the kind of national average figure. Mm. Um, that was something that we saw when we were looking at um, the excess deaths figures across Europe, that um, even when we looked at the countries um, that were hit the hardest in the first wave, so for instance, Italy or for instance, Sweden, um, there, were lots of there were lots of regions within those countries that were not affected at all. Um, so if we, aren't, if we aren't addressing those huge differences, um, if we're just kind of talking about that national average that you mentioned, then that story isn't, the story that we tell isn't going to ring true for so many readers. Um, it's not going to like, it's not going to reflect their experiences at all. Um, so I think if we are able to break it down on a much more granular level, we, we have a better chance of, of achieving that, of giving them a story that they can kind of, that resonates for them. Mm -hmm. Which is even why I think that it's, it's so important to, you know, I found it always fascinating how the concept of average is much more shared widely than median and, you know, concepts like percentiles, for instance. I don't know if you, if, I mean, it's it's fascinating how this average is something everyone uses in, in everyday language. Uh, whereas, you know, concepts which are, I mean, it would help you just to, you know, get a bit more, you know, clear picture of, of reality, actually, are not so common. 
Um, and I, yeah, that's it's something which um, which is interesting to me, at least um, in writing stories. <laughs> yeah, and and this again, I think, it brings back to, to more general issues with the with data literacy of both journalists mm -hmm. uh, and readers. Uh, and, transparency and be, being able to explain what what you did and the choices you made and the categories mm. you use and all this uh, which is <laughs> challenging in general if you do that to journalism i think not, not just about european issues uh, any sort of of topics uh, or perspective you you look at it and um, and yeah um, i don't know if there's uh, anything uh, that you, you wanted to come back to or add to, to this conversation? You feel we, we forgot to mention uh, anything important? Or... <laughs> um, I don't think so. We've covered so much. <laughs> yeah. We talked yeah, quite a lot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah... I think we, we've touched uh, at least some uh, of the main or some of the challenges uh, with doing data journalism on European issues. So the, the sources, the, the comparability, the languages, the, the framing, uh, at least, yeah, some some of the challenges are, are on the table, let's say. And then we could talk <laughs> many, many more hours, I think, and bring in a few dozen examples from from our own experience, but um, yeah, hopefully it is already provides a picture um, on European um, data journalism. So if, uh, Alexander, yeah. No, no, I just wanted to thank you, Lorenzo, for the chat. It was really interesting. <laughs> so just a thank you for the record. Okay, so uh, it, it, it's yeah. me thanking you, uh, Alexander and Clara, for, for being with us today thank you for inviting us and um, thanks to, uh, to the listeners and uh, see you or so uh, talk soon bye <laughs>